Great. Uh, well, first off, uh, folks, uh, welcome to uh, Innovative UCLA members, uh, UCLA students, uh, faculty, staff, uh, to our greetings to our esteemed uh, speakers and then our guests uh, in general. Um, my name is Trent Johnson, uh, and in addition to my role uh, on Innovate at UCLA, I lead the Corporate Ventures Business Unit at uh, C uh, Digital Labs. Uh, we build startups for corporates, investors, and founders, and many, uh, much as many of your companies, we're also competing uh, in the current uh, tight tech labor market. Uh, so the session today is to explore just that state of the SoCal jobs market uh, at, at a micro level, but also more broadly uh, looking at uh, the glo global trends that we see around uh, tech trends, uh, particularly as it pertains to the de high desired skills uh, within digital. Um, so when we look at the literature out in the landscape, uh, you know, there was this recent uh, study done by Microsoft where they predict that uh, current tech jobs are expected to go uh, from 41 million in 2020 to 190 million in, in 2025. Um, when you couple that with other trends that we're seeing that came as a result of the pandemic, you know, things like uh, a greater reliance on technology for online and e-commerce, uh, a, a growth in uh, tech job postings, remote work, and even migration, physical migration of, of people out of major cities into some rural areas, the impact on commercial real estate and just the general speed of recovery. Uh, it's, it's really hard to read the tea leaves and know what the impact of those things are gonna be on the uh, tech jobs market. Uh, so to that end, our contributors today will provide um, a variety of insights from some very unique perspectives. Uh, we have speakers from uh, Corn Ferry. Uh, Corn Ferry is a global organization consulting uh, and talent acquisition shop. So they're going to have a very interesting demand perspective. Uh, we're also joined uh, by uh, contributors from um, the UCLA Anderson forecast. Uh, the forecast is over 60 years old, and it's, it's probably one of the go-to within business and Wall Street, um, providing uh, economic data for the California and the US. Uh, and, and one interesting factoid uh, for those folks, they predicted both the 2001 uh, recession and uh, the, the more recent 2020 COVID recession. Uh, and then lastly, we're going to have some contribution from UCLA Extension. Um, UCLA Ex Extension has been around for over a century. It's one of the oldest professional and continuing education providers in the U.S. Uh, and they're basically going to help our guests understand how UCLA in particular uh, can help shore up some of those uh, high demand um, skill sets uh, that are going to be needed uh, and basically help our guests uh, make the most uh, of this uh, jobs environment uh, for themselves and for their companies. Um, so we're about to get started shortly, uh, just in terms of some housekeeping items. Um, what uh, we agreed with our speakers is that we would uh, hold questions till the, uh, the content is delivered. Um, so um, we would ask that uh, guests uh, stay on mute uh, while the speakers do their bit. Uh, and then we'll save time uh, for Q&A. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, you feel free to put them in the chat uh, box. Uh, and then when we go through that segment, I'll be happy to tee those up uh, to our speakers. Um, with that, uh, happy to now uh, introduce our first uh, two speakers uh, from uh, Corn Ferry, uh, Tarun Inuganti and Gus de Camargo. Um, let me uh, hand it over to you gentlemen and uh, feel free to share your uh, presentations as we get started. Thank you. Thanks Trent. Uh, Rafi, are you gonna share the screen? Should I share our screen here? Uh, you'll you'll be sharing the screen. Okay, give me a minute. So does everybody get to see the screen here? Yep. Excellent. So thank you again, Trent, for uh, inviting us and having giving us an opportunity to present uh, our point of view on the marketplace. Uh, as you all well know, uh, technology as an as a organizational challenge has been particularly challenged in the last few years, but has been increasingly more complex over the last seven to 10 years. And as a result, uh, we're seeing some significant changes and trends in the marketplace, and we wanted to share some of them with you. Um, so let me first start off with our agenda for the day. Um, we're gonna make a couple of introductions, Gus and I, I will introduce ourselves. 
Uh, we'll give you a quick introduction to Corn Ferry, um, sort of very quick around what we do and what's beyond what you, what's normally perceived as Corn Ferry. Um, talk, give you a sense of the market trends and te technology environment. Uh, we'll talk about an evolving technology organization. This is a, a conceptual idea, but that's evolving at a rapid pace. And the new workforce skills that are required to uh, deliver those uh, changes. And then we'll talk about uh, something that's important to you and to us, uh, which is how do we address these challenges? How do we retain? How do we find uh, and attract these people? Um, so Gus and I will yin and yang through this uh, presentation. But let me start off with Gus. Do you want to quickly introduce yourself? And uh, we'll put us your sure, profile sure. up here. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tarun, and uh, thank you, everyone, for having us. A great, uh, great to meet you all. Um, I lead our North American technology practice here for Corn Ferry for our professional search business. Uh, so the work that we do uh, is entirely focused on the domain area of information technology. Most of that work, folks, will typically sort of center in five key areas of the ecosystem for us, software engineering and architecture, data analytics, cloud, information security, and digital technologies, where we spend most of our time energy with clients and candidates alike. Um, I began my career in software and solution sales, um, spent uh, probably about three or four years doing that and then flipped over to the world of search and executive search. And I've been in this industry now for about 17 years, all of that in technology. Um, really appreciate the opportunity again to, to speak with you today, share some of our understanding about the marketplace and this domain area. And uh, you know, we appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Gus. Uh, this is Tarun Inaganti. I'm based here in California. Uh, been with uh, in the executive search business for about 20 years. Uh, focused my entire career in uh, executive search in the technology offices practice, particularly. Uh, I actually started my career at Corn Ferry. I was here for five years. Went away to Spencer Stewart for about 16 years, uh, both in California and then in London for a while. And I've been back here and I've joined rejoined Corn Ferry last year. Uh, my interests in, uh, are entirely in the evol evolution of the technology leader, particularly the fun functional technology leader. And as I described, my portfolio work has cut across um, a variety of sectors and industries uh, and some of that I've share, shared on the bio here. So uh, that's me quickly moving on to Corn Ferry. So most of us know Corn Ferry as an executive search firm. Uh, that's sort of the heritage of the firm. That's where we started. But uh, in the 16 years that I left Corn Ferry, went to Spencer Stewart, uh, actually Corn Ferry has embarked on building a complete end-to-end -end talent uh, solutions marketplace. So I won't go through each of these, but you can see uh, the, the breadth of our experience. We, the best way I've heard this framed up um, that may help you is we can help you with the talent you need but we can also help you with the talent you already have. Uh, so the way to think about it is, you know, we can help you bring in executive talent, executive search, professional search at all levels, but we can help you coach, assess, retain, develop, um, you know, make your organization better, all of that. So it's an interesting continuum. The market is demanding it, and I think we're doing it uh, very effectively. And the next slide probably illustrates the, the breadth of our impact, both from a local, global, uh, sort of details of our information, the companies we serve, uh, the breadth is just uh, mind blowing. And this was one of the big reasons I came back to Corn Ferry because the clients are, the way the talent uh, demands are changing in the marketplace is, is requiring a firm to have this range of services. So that's uh, Corn Ferry and our impact. I promise to spend very little time on that and quickly move to talking about the evolution of technology. So I think there's a uh, couple of things to start off, right? Uh, if you think about the last uh, five years per se, um, technology and its impact on organizations at large has been very dramatic. I know that's an overused statement, um, but it's in, in fact, if you look across every industry, I think the big lesson here is either you leverage technology or you'd be entirely disrupted. Um, I think uh, many of us who are technologists in the, in the audience will recognize that the one thing that's changed dramatically is compute power. Uh, the price of compute power, the our ability to transact uh, at a much faster clip has just dramatically changed every organization's ability to 
compete in the marketplace. So, um, and the pandemic, of course, um, no one predicted it uh, in many ways, but uh, when we're in it, we, we learned a lot, uh, particularly on the impact of technology. So um, Conferi's technology practice pulled together some of the leading technology leaders um, in the country across all sectors, everything from uh, sectors that have been completely disrupted um, by the pandemic, um, to, like the airlines, to sectors that have actually benefited from the pandemic, like grocery chains. And uh, we came away with some learnings from the audience and uh, want to share some of those themes with you. So the first one is, what is going on here? I mean, so you think about how we've evolved, how we partner, how we collaborate, how we share information. This is a dramatic shift in how we have to adapt and how we have to change. Um, you know, obviously starting off with how do we sustain, maintain, continue to accelerate after the, you think about it, May, April and May last year, we completely shut down to companies and particularly technology leaders and many of you in the audience have, have adapted and learned new ways of collaborating. And this has created very different challenges in the marketplace. How do you collaborate? How do you team as I talked about, but how do you develop? How do you grow people, right? Um, while technology teams are more adapt to working virtually, I think there are many other groups that, that are being challenged to do this, particularly the C-suite. They're used to being in person, you know, ex exchanging ideas, that's not happening. So when you uh, think about the role of the technology leader, how do you reimagine that? How do you make that work? Is all a, a big part of this challenge here. Um, that's sort of one, one theme that's we developed. Obviously, uh, the digital acceleration comment uh, that we heard earlier uh, is, I don't know how to understate or overstate this, right? Um, Digital is uh, in many ways a difficult, complex uh, seven letter word that in many ways has to be defined by the maturity of every single organization. I think uh, this is where the acceleration that has been caused uh, in many ways by the pandemic um, is continuing to accelerate. And as we sit in a market that's coming out of this and uh, you know, Gus and I have seen this trend all the way from June and July of last year where the demand for technology talent has only increased. It hasn't slowed down, even through the pandemic. Uh, I think um, June, July was about 90% back to where it was pre-pandemic. And now we're, I don't think there's enough people in the room to, to fill the projects we have going on. So this is driven completely by so many different transformation journeys from sectors and industries to maturity of organizations to uh, you know, the ability of organizations to either invest or completely change the business model to adapt to continued market uh, challenge. Uh, you know, we've, we've talked about virtual talent. We've talked about the impact of cyber. Um, you know, the, the issue on virtual talent is, a, is going to be telling in the next few months. Uh, as many of you know, Google made a statement, I think a few uh, weeks ago, which basically mandated that um, all employees will be working in a site, a Google site, uh, starting in July or August, other than 14 days um, that they can work from home and only with permission. I think a, a technology company who has mostly, more than others, a flexibility to do that, when they start doing it, I think we're going to see a trend of people coming back to the office. But how that happens, how that, how we facilitate the others that cannot come back, um, and you know, obviously all the vaccine stuff that is still being rolled out uh, is going to impact all that. But we're seeing some significant trends around where you know, organizations are shifting. And this is not just being felt by technology leaders, but everyone in the C-suite is um, trying to sort, sort through how do we get here? How do we move quickly? How do we not get disrupted? How do we create new business models and value chains to, to embrace this new shift? Um, it is a compelling, exciting, and fun new uh, journey that uh, all of us are going to be on for a while. Clearly, uh, the events of um, uh, the last year, other than the pandemic, uh, is, is also impacting how we look 
um, as a lens, a diversity lens, particularly in the tech space, and it's uh, impacted on in many ways by um, you know the diversity, lack of diversity in tech. Um, while there's been many efforts around STEM and other other organizations that are accelerating this growth, it's still a gap. It's uh, a gap in available talent uh, and a gap in demand from, you know, uh, understandable demand from our clients. So I think one of the things that uh, many of us are doing and we're encouraging both our clients and candidates to do is to accelerate their focus on diversity and how they think about it. Um, clearly data and analytics has been the driver of any digital transformation. Um, the compute power that I was talking about earlier when uh, the iPhone that we all carry around is about $800 approximately. Uh, it carries the uh, power of a supercomputer just less than four years ago or five years ago at maybe you know, one thirtieth of the price. You can tell the difference that data analytics uh, is making on organizations, right? You can make better decisions faster. You can make more impactful business choices. Uh, leveraging data in many ways. So the demand and the need for data and analytics and, you know, I'm not, we're not, I'm just starting data and analytics. I'm not even going to AI because the impact of AI that we're already seeing in our day-to-day -day life uh, is pretty significant. So this is uh, all of this to say a couple of things. One is the technology organization that we know is shifting dramatically. Our hypothesis, and it's being borne out in many ways, uh, is this is what we think is the new technology organization. No longer is it the traditional applications and infrastructure construct that we've used historically. Um, you know, somebody is uh, building out the ERP or the solution sets the business needs, and then there's an infrastructure group that's standing up, uh, making sure that the the business runs and the phones operate and all of that stuff. That's all important, critical. It's the foundation of the business. But, you know, these four buckets that we're talking about, and I'll start at the left bottom and I'll start with data. Data is a driver. Uh, it is the highest demand uh, talent out there. I mean, we don't have enough data people to go drive and deliver what the client, our clients are looking for. Again, talking about uh, the ability to leverage and use data to make the decisions faster or build this new business uh, business lines are is incredible. Um, we're seeing demands uh, demand for this kind of talent way across the organization, and uh, and the demand for this talent can start at various levels. Whether you already have a data platform, if you do have that already, leveraging that is much faster, but depending on the maturity of the organization, you know, sometimes you need people to just come in and build a data platform before you can actually leverage it to do other things with it. Um, so data is one thing. Um, the other piece is the prioritization of IT. It used to be that we used to have a project-based approach um, to IT where we took a long term, you know, we're going to roll this out. It's going to take three to four years. We'll build a big bang uh, solution set that uh, will solve everything. That's changed. You know, the ability of organizations to leverage and build smaller groups that are focused on productized business ideas and how do you deliver against them is going to be critical. It is increasingly critical. Most of the progressive organizations in the, in the country have taken this approach. Um, everything from organizations like Yum Brands to Home Depot to you know, even much smaller and more nimble organizations like Ring Central and others have adopted this and are moving at a much more rapid pace. And it's actually one of the roles that we've also seen move into general management functions as well, uh, understandably so. The second, the third piece is engineering. What does engineering mean and why is it in an IT organization? Um, engineering is the ability of an organization to stand up and deliver technology at a much more rapid pace than they would be if they took an offshore outsource model. Now there is an offshore outsource model opportunity as well, but that's not critical because here you're talking about energizing an internal team to really build solutions that they will see an immediate result for, both from a business side, because business leaders usually come to us or come to you, 
uh, and suggest, well, we need these solution sets to build. And we'll say, well, well, we'll figure out how we can do it and how we prioritize it. This ability to build internal engineering teams is it delivers a couple of things. One is it makes technology or IT interesting and sexy again and lets you actually compete against some of the more exciting consumer faced uh, businesses that you know some of our younger generation particularly align themselves to. So this is a, another trend line. And obvious, the obvious one, the next one is information security. Um, you know, all of these things we're talking about, data, product, engineering, creates so much, so much opportunity for the bad people, uh, for competitive competitors otherwise to come in and take that through. So security is the other fourth layer that we are beginning to see in organizations that are taking a more holistic view to a more progressive approach to how do you deliver to technology solutions. So that's my, uh, my our hypothesis. I'd love to talk to you when we get to Q&A if you have a perspective on this. Um, so how does this all revolve into what are IT professionals of tomorrow today being called for? As we know, this is a has been a constant evolution. Um, just in the last many years, you've seen so many dramatic shifts in technology, the use of technology. Um, I remember six or seven years ago, many of us will say, uh, and we were, I was called on many, can we find a chief cloud officer? Um, you know, now cloud is a commodity. Mm -hmm. uh, cloud is just a platform piece, right? Uh, now we're talking about AI, data, product, engineering, you know, um, and this is what we're, we're going to need in terms of the technology leaders of tomorrow. How do you innovate, not just for today? How do you innovate at the pace of the market? Uh, it's uh, our customers, you know, um, Gus Trent and I were, were chuckling a little while ago before everyone got on about how our kids don't know what a, uh, what a rotary phone is or a dial-up modem is. Um, and that was not long. That was not too long ago, by the way. Um, so, what was going to happen in the next couple of years is even more dramatic as AI and everything changes. So, we've got to have develop, retain, you know, accelerate the learning patterns of uh, uh, the talent already internally. And then, obviously, you know, we got to run the business for today. You got to perform. You got to deliver. You've got to create value. Um, and that's not, you know, I'm not saying you got to do just the innovation part and forget the running of the business. But when we look for leaders, um, we're looking for all of this. But it's also important to recognize that we also have to develop talent to, get, to adapt to this. Hopefully that's helpful, Gus. Yep. Thanks, Tarun. Um, so a lot of the changes that Tarun talked about in terms of the technology function and uh, how that's evolved over recent years has really had a pretty significant impact just in terms of the talent itself, how organizations uh, view talent, what's best in class and, and how that's changed in terms of our client size, in terms of organization size, in terms of what they're looking for and what they need to acquire and build upon uh, to run uh, their businesses. So um, really kind of this need for innovation, for transformation versus just running of the business has really shifted how organizations think about skills. And, um, and in today's sort of dynamic economy, uh, both technical and behavior. So um, yeah, as I was saying, both technical and behavioral skills have become uh, highly important for different reasons. You'll see some of those listed here on this slide. Uh, but just kind of sort of double click a little bit on the functional behavioral side. Uh, I think in some ways that's when, in my opinion, where some of the biggest changes have taken place in terms of interest and attention in how we view talent today in the technology world. Um, things like the ability to work best when targets are not clear, when the environment is very dynamic is an example. Um, clients are looking for individuals who have demonstrated a track record of heavy and continuous collaboration really folks who have an emphasis on practical implications uh, individuals for example who gain knowledge through experience in, in experimentation uh, and really kind of trying to apply that experimentation and those experiences in new situations um, other themes that we've seen are the, the notion of adaptability right people who are comfortable 
in, in anticipated changes of direction or approach, that is now a, a key and sort of a premium expectation for many organizations. Um, another big one I would say on the behavioral side is curiosity, right? Tackling problems in a novel way, see patterns in complex information and pursue sort of that deep understanding that, that uh, you know, inherent desire to understand things uh, is become incredibly important in technology talent and how that's viewed. Um, another one uh, is risk taking, right? So, you know, folks who are willing to make decisions or changes based on very limited information, that's sort of a key and, and sort of common expectation today in terms of how companies view tech talent. Uh, and then maybe the final one I'll mention on behavioral side is, is innovation, right? Folks who have this mindset of creating new, better ways for an organization uh, to be successful. So those are some examples of sort of behavioral functional attributes that organizations are really centered on today and that weren't necessarily thinking about a few years ago. Um, shifting a little bit on the technical side, um, we, um, we really look at, uh, clients are really looking at execution skills as paramount today. So think of this as talent that can deliver versus oversee, right? Um, so when we think about some of the things that Tarun just mentioned in the, in the, in the previous slides, there's a substantial complexity and cost in, in this kind of new systems architecture. The risk of driving change is quite significant without the right talent to sort of lead that necessary change management and execute the right operating model. Um, also exposure to an agile scrum methodology, right, where there's things such as continuous integration, continuous deployment, uh, those type of environments are becoming almost table stakes. Um, individuals are operating in a DevOps environment. Those are all becoming common expectations now in terms of the kind of tech shop that, you know, um, the key employers want to see people bringing experience with. A premium is also being placed on project product management skills and the user experience. So really a mindset that really connects with digital transformational efforts. So that's become incredibly important. And finally, a big one is what I describe as cross discipline development. So um, organizations today operating in that scrum agile model um, software engineering, for example, is very much a team sport. And so organizations are really thinking about talent from a perspective of who are the best technology athletes versus uh, who are the, the specialists. The, the premiums really been put on individuals that can cross pollinate skills across the IT function versus just being, you know, an incredibly specialized and focused skill set um, as a premium. And, and that was very much the case in the past. Uh, Tarun, if we could hop to the next slide, please. Um, you're going to see here just a quick representation of, of the talent scenario on a global perspective. Uh, you know, pretty self-explanatory uh, slide, but I think, you know, some of the things I would note is the, the, the talent deficit that we see, particularly in the United States, uh, also in Brazil and places like Indonesia. Um, but, but, you know, that, that is a significant talent deficit that exists in, the, in that region of the world. I think it's also noteworthy to note the talent surplus that exists in places like India and, and really the, the effects that this has on unrealized output in result of the talent deficit. If we can go to slide 15, please, Tarun. Um, so slide 15, here we kind of like, uh, I wanted to sort of outline some of the key trends or recent trends that we're seeing in terms of talent acquisition. And these are some of the things that are really impacting the supply and demand dynamic that we just touched on on the last slide. Things like restrictions on visa applications are really impacting technology hiring. And obviously that's changing from administration to administration, but uh, these restrictions and especially the recent restrictions on visa applications has had a major effect on technology hiring. Um, obviously the technology market to Tarun's points earlier are, are, is not cooling down or slowing down in any way, quite the opposite. It's actually accelerating and elevating further. Um, graduation rates in the United States in terms of computer science, mathematics, engineering are declining. And that's obviously having an impact on the supply of talent future and, and, and thereafter. Um, demand in general far outweighs the supply of talent, right, which is creating competition in the market. It's increasing compensation levels for the talent that does exist. Um, spending in terms of technology is really increasing, in particularly in five key areas of the ecosystem, software engineering architecture, data analytics, 
digital, cloud technology, and information security. Um, the, other, the other thing that's really a, a big trend now in our world is the candidate experience. So given the nature of how competitive the talent market is today, uh, this notion of the candidate experience is something that needs to be really closely monitored in order to be competitive. Um, how the candidate feels about the process in terms of engaging with the organization from applying for the job to interviewing and to uh, securing the role. What that experience looks like has become incredibly important. It makes a huge difference in terms of whether you win or lose in the acquiring of that desired talent. Um, also, on that point, um, the notion of stickiness, right, once the talent is on board is becoming very important as well. This retention aspect, uh, there's an incredible amount of time, money, and energy that's put into acquiring the right talent. Uh, I mean, think about it. All of that could be a huge waste if you're not securing the talent and retaining that talent for an extended period of time. And that's become a huge talent, a huge challenge, excuse me, in technology, particularly because we're, individuals are looking to be a bit more transient today so they can gain new experiences, work with different people, learn from other uh, industries or experiences. So this, this notion of uh, retaining talent has become incredibly challenging, challenging for most organizations. And then finally, those roles that kind of straddle business and technology are some of the most difficult skills to acquire and, and certainly uh, some the balance of skills that's also most difficult to train and develop. Uh, that is probably uh, represents some of the roles where we see the greatest level of, 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 of need and attention in the marketplace from clients. Think of your product management roles as a good example of that. Um, so, so, so these are some of the key themes that we're seeing in the marketplace that are really playing an important role in terms of talent acquisition. Um, Tarun, if you could skip ahead, we're going to talk a little bit about attracting and recruiting talent now. And one of the big things as we think about this um, is, is really the employee value proposition, right? So firms like us, firms like Corn Ferry and others are pretty much almost in nearly every scenario looking to displace a gainfully employed professional or leader from another organization or institution and bring that person over to our client. Um, in order to garner that kind of interest, delivering on a, a compelling employee value proposition is, is frankly key and critical. Um, and when we think about an employee value proposition, you really think about this at, at three different levels. You think of the company story, you think of the story of the technology function itself, and then you think of the story of the position or role itself. And as we talk, you know, it's, it's an old sort of uh, notion in, in executive search and, and in recruiting that we're storytellers, right? And when we're doing the storytelling, we really need to hit on those three elements of the employee value, uh, value proposition if we have any chance of gaining an interest or engagement with that particular candidate. Um, so we need to talk about things like uh, outlining how the individual will make an impact in this respective organization, how they will be able to put their fingerprint on the business. Um, we need to reference skills, experiences that they're going to gain um, from their career, from, from this role in terms of their career, how they're going to improve their professional skill set through this job. Uh, we need to articulate specific technologies, tools, platforms that these individuals will need to interface with, that they will get to work with. And that becomes a key attractor as well for a lot of individuals. Um, also, we need to outline and, and highlight some of the prominent leaders that these individuals will get to interface, work with, and learn from. Uh, there's a huge notion in technology, and Google's sort of notorious for this, using the, the anchor hire concept, right, where you bring in um, a tremendous, um, you know, leader who has a huge presence in the in the industry, and that individual effectively operates as a magnet for talent. People want to come into the organization just to get to work and learn from these um, from these individuals. And lastly, uh, culture and diversity is probably another key element of that of that story of that employee value proposition. Speaking about how the individual, uh, how the organization, excuse me, thinks about culture, thinks about diversity, thinks about inclusion. Those are becoming increasingly important topic areas for candidates as they consider different opportunities. Um, 
So uh, th this kind of sort of complete, continues a little bit on the previous point, uh, the, the, the the importance and 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 sort of how important talking about the employee value proposition has become. Um, really aligning that to the strategy of the organization, aligning that to a culture set of prospective employees, and and really using that as a key, key driver in the strategy and how you acquire talent. Um, also, the way companies think about talent today is also very different than in the past. It's become more than what's needed today. Uh, think about uh, organizations are thinking much more about what's needed for the future and how an individual aligns to a culture set or a belief system. So things like personality, values, things like aptitude or interdependencies and leadership are all closely considered. Uh, and are all things that perhaps in the past organizations weren't paying as much attention to is largely around skills, experiences, attribute, maybe leadership would have been something they would have looked at before, but much less of an emphasis around um, personality values and, and things like aptitude. Uh, Tarun, I'm going to hand it over to you for the next couple of slides here. Yeah, I think just uh, picking up on uh, what Gus was saying, right? Uh, retention is key. Uh, it's a very competitive landscape. Uh, you have people like Gus and I reaching out from behalf of our clients uh, to attract very happily employed people. So I think there's a, you know, if you talk about the younger generation, all of these pieces that uh, Gus was talking about, culture, d and employee experience is super, super important. Um, and how you define define demonstrated, live the values, um, identify the culture, look the internal stakeholders is all super critical. So if you think about the employee experience, just expanding on what Gus shared, uh, the ability to listen to your teams internally, uh, understand their sentiments, what they're thinking about, how do you engage with them? Leading a shift in culture. If your culture is established and not evolving or not moving at the pace of the market, it's really important to do that. Um, the diversity and inclusion piece is an obvious one that I know everybody's working very hard at, but it's making a statement, recognizing it, and really making a conscious effort to change and engage with the community at large, as well as internally, is super important to the emerging uh, employee there. So on the capability side, um, you know, we're we're looking at different skills five years ago than we looked at today. Um, you know, the ability to inspire, ability to drive and get people together on the same page is a real important piece. Uh, creating a sense of purpose is more important today than ever, ever has been. Uh, connecting a team across the organization is the other piece, the ability to partner. Uh, and uh, despite what I said earlier about Google coming back to work, we're going to be in some kind of a virtual world for a while to come. So the ability to share ideas, mentor, grow, develop people in this virtual world is going to be super critical. And the other piece is, uh, you know, accelerating the transformation, right? People have to have the ability to quickly fail if they have to. Try new ideas, fail, anticipate changes. It's okay to fail. Uh, it doesn't have to be, and it's easy to fail when you're doing small things one at a time rather than taking that big bang approach to things. So leadership and how we develop them, uh, how we assess them is changing and it's changing at the pace of, as the technology market is shifting. So that's uh, sort of where we are and we can talk a little bit about, Gus, you wanna take the developing routine? Yeah. yeah, you bet, you bet. And it's gonna kind of a little bit build on what you just shared, Tarun, in terms of, so what can organizations be doing to develop and retain talent? How should they be thinking about this in order to be successful through these challenges. And that's really a key and critical point. And, and in, in some ways, this has some of the most interesting information in the section of the, of the presentation. So, um, you know, what, what, are, what are Gen Z's thinking about, right? What's important to them and what's key and critical in terms of how they consider different job opportunities and how they think about their career. Um, and, and, and these are considerations that employers really need to be in tune with. Um, first of all, many individuals um, in this generation see traditional organizations, they perceive them as slow, as slow to innovate. Um, many lack interesting set of problems to solve. Many lack modern technologies to work with. 
this is a perception, right or wrong, but many individuals in this generation think this way and, and have this preconceived notion about many organizations. Um, think of it, it's a young idealistic talent community who um, they're not interested anymore in merely supporting the business. Technology no longer supports the business. They feel like technology represents a key and strategic aspect of the business. And in many ways, in many organizations, it is the business. Um, they also have a different view around uh, how they think about career opportunities. Career opportunities, I mean, think of the old job descriptions that we've all seen. You need to have this, you should have that. This is, it's a checklist of things that you need to have as a, as a professional uh, in your background in order to be qualified. Well, those job descriptions have changed a lot, folks. Um, those job descriptions need to clearly outline the challenges that these individuals are going to be involved in solving. They need to articulate a message in terms of how the work they're going to be doing impacts change, impacts the world, impacts their communities. And if, if fundamentally, if it does not include those, um, you know, those, those topic areas, you're, you're just not competitive. You're not in line with the rest of what the market is doing. Slide, uh, let's move on to slide 23, turn, please. Uh, so uh, interesting graph here, obviously, Corn Ferry data. We uh, you know, ran a lot of data to analyze really how, um, how organizations uh, are really, and candidates, excuse me, are thinking differently okay, uh, about uh, the things that matter most to them. And I think you'll see some interesting data points here, particularly around company culture. You can see kind of you know, the variance over the last five years on that aspect alone, um, things around career progression, right? So that's become incredibly important. So less so about I'm working for Bank of America, but more so thinking about I'm working for a startup, but I'm gaining some incredible experience here that's gonna add and build on my career. Um, company mission and values, you can see kind of a shift there, which is pretty, pretty meaningful. Things like flexible working environments, less of an interest around job stability. I, I don't care that, you know, this is a high risk uh, opportunity and, and you know, um, so that, 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 you know, they're not enamored by company brand reputation. This is a different type of candidate community. And so uh, there's little interest in the prestige of a brand and job security or stability. They're very interested in flexibility in terms of how, where, and when they work. Uh, the generation is a generation that's not interested in traditional career models. They're energized by solving problems that they're working on. And lastly, um, I think it's critically important that organizations really participate in the talent communities where the talent exists, where the talent interacts. This allows them to actually gain credibility through that process. And, you know, we're talking about things like meetups, online forums, industry events, being present in those type of ecosystems gives employers um, the opportunity to be relevant, to be credible with this type of talent community, because that's where they're interfacing. Um, um, so with that, we will um, uh, pivot a bit and we're gonna shift gears very quickly uh, to our third speaker, um, who is uh, Dr. Yu uh, over at the Anderson Forecast. Uh, and Dr. Yu is going to share with us, uh, you know, a view into the digital tech jobs in the U.S. and a, a bit of a finer point here on uh, SoCal. Uh, so with that, Dr. Yu, we'll hand it over to you. All right. Thank you, Trent. Uh, can you guys see my slides? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I just want to follow that uh, UCLA extension demo. Um, I, I can personally say that program is really great. And one of the reasons is because I also teach there. Yeah, so it's, it's very good. Uh, so uh, let me introduce myself a little bit. So I'm the economist at UCLA Anderson Forecast. So besides doing the economic forecasting, I also teach at uh, UCLA Extension for Data Science and also uh, at UCLA uh, Anderson School of Master of uh, Business Analytics. So today I'm very honored to talk about uh, the trend of digital tech jobs in the United States uh, to you guys. Okay, so let me give you the big picture of uh, the job change over the past year. So we know the pandemic really uh, changed a lot to the US economy. So this is by uh, industry, major industry. So on the left, you can see the legal and hospitality. 
declined uh, the most, uh, almost uh, 20% from uh, February last year, just right the peak before the pandemic up to the latest uh, March 2021. Um, um, and the second bar is uh, information sector. So uh, that is not really about this uh, tech industry. It's mostly driven by entertainment industry, telecommunication uh, industry. And in the middle, you can see um, the total non-farm payroll job um, over the past year declined by 5.5%. Uh, we still are uh, a loss of 9 million jobs. And if you can go to see on the right, um, a lot of the tech job, uh, tech talent actually work in this uh, professional and management uh, sector. So right now you can see only decline of compared to the pre-pandemic peak 1.4%. And the second right bar is this so-called transportation and warehousing. So that is because with the acceleration of the e-commerce, everybody is buying shopping online uh, uh, with Amazon. So there's a huge demand of this kind of a delivery uh, 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 workforce. And on the right is the financial activity. So you can see basically um, um, if you are in a high skill industry, uh, you, uh, you did relatively well uh, during this pandemic. So right now I'm gonna show you the specific uh, high-tech industry. So there are four major sectors by this uh, Nessie's code. Uh, for example, the blue line is software publisher, like Apple uh, Tableau is in this category. So the chart is showing the, a job in this tech industry uh, since uh, January 2018 and how does it uh, uh, go uh, over the past uh, two or three years. So you can see the black line is the total non-farm payroll job dropped significant during the pandemic and recover with still a 5% uh, kind of gap. Um, but if you look at the blue line, which is software publisher, they, they basically uh, is doing very well, slightly decline a little bit during the pandemic, but right now it's fully recovered. And the second orange line is other information services doing very well. And the green line is data processing, housing, uh, hosting services. Um, uh, I, I think uh, like Amazon, Google, Facebook, the company, they are all in this category. And the red line is computer system design services. Um, I think uh, maybe Adobe, uh, uh, those kind of company is in this category. So basically high tech industry is doing well uh, compared to the over uh, road economy. So, Right now, let me give you the uh, uh, regional uh, uh, change. Um, so uh, uh, like a trend you were talking about uh, in the beginning. Um, so people are very concerned, how does this pandemic impact um, uh, the, the, the geography of the tech jobs? Uh, and in California, we are particularly concerned about, for example, we heard this uh, Tesla moving to Texas, Oracle moving to uh, Austin. So how does that change? So in this chart, I show you the yellow bar is uh, the, the data in February, 2020. So just right before the pandemic and the blue bar is uh, the data uh, after um, the pandemic, September, 2020. So that is the latest data I can get from QCEW. So you can see um, for this uh, job in computer system design and reality service industry, um, you can see some kind of uh, basically uh, mixed uh, performance uh, in terms of uh, jobs in Bay Area and Southern California. And data you can see others, you, you will see uh, Seattle actually is doing very well across these uh, four uh, subsectors. And we can see general decline in New York metro, uh, metro area. Um, so here, uh, the, this Travis is Austin. Uh, Texas. So you can see um, uh, just during this uh, right before and after the pandemic, this uh, sector job increased 3.1%. So maybe Oracle is in there already. Um, on, on the right, Los Angeles declined um, uh, more uh, in this sector. But most of the jobs uh, are still um, in Santa Clara County, which is Silicon Valley. Yeah. Um, let me see, Fairfax is Washington DC, Middle Sex is Boston. All right, uh, on the right, this is uh, another information uh, service industry. 
So you can see, for example, um, here actually Silicon Valley was gaining job during that period, uh, 6.1%. Um, and Chicago losing a lot of jobs uh, during that period. Los Angeles, we are gaining some job here. Okay. And in this industry, software publisher industry, you can see um, this is Seattle uh, and increase 5.3%. And Los Angeles here, we gain some job 2.1%. And City County lost some job. On the right, uh, this is a uh, so this is, uh, uh, so if you look at uh, like over job market, we found out as a whole economy, San Francisco and Manhattan, New York actually suffered the most uh, due to this pandemic because of uh, a lot of reasons. And actually in this sector, we didn't see that kind of uh, things. Uh, in this sector, the job increased 3.5% uh, in San Francisco city. Uh, but in New York, uh, declined by 3.9%. And Los Angeles, we are doing uh, fine, increased 2.6%. All right, so this is the uh, industry job, but you know, it is not really the accurate measurement of the digital tech job because um, uh, this kind of number of job include uh, sales, include marketing, you know, legal whatsoever. So right now, um, later I'm gonna show you next slides. So this is uh, the, uh, this high tech job density, okay? So I take the total job by this county divided by to, uh, the tech job divided by the total county job as a percentage. So the dark, darker color represent uh, those county with a higher tech uh, density, all right? So you can see um, uh, we have some cluster around the country. Southern California is one. Bay Area, um, Northwest, and Northeast Corridor from Boston all the way to uh, DC, and Florida, Texas, Colorado, Salt Lake City, Phoenix, all right, so Texas. So basically uh, those gray area or white area basically means there's no tech job, high tech industry job at all. So we can say this tech job are mostly concentrated in the cities, Maybe, maybe it's a very big city or small city, but not in the rural area. So that is uh, related to Gus was talking about where are the, uh, uh, the, the, the talent. Um, okay, so right now I'm gonna focus on the occupation. So right now we really are gonna focus on uh, the occupation job specifically related to digital technology. So this is the latest data I, I can get is from occupational employment statistic in May, 2020. So which is the data after the pandemic. So, so you can see this is the occupation, major occupation. And uh, I think the, the best occupation to describe the digital tech job is this uh, computer and mathematical um, occupation. So we got uh, 4.6 million jobs uh, in 2020 in the United States, which is a, about 3.3% of the whole workforce. So right now, um, I would like to show you the median wage by these uh, occupations, major occupations. So the median wage you can say is kind of uh, indicator to reflect the underlying talent, uh, skill, education, productivity or innovation. So number highest pay uh, occupation is management. Of course, you know, that's not surprising at all. And number two is digital tech job, computer and mathematical. So it's $91,000 uh, in 2020. And if you go to see the middle, the all, that's the, the median wage for all the sector, all the occupation job in the United States. Okay. And here I show you the, the job change, this occupation job change over the past two years from May 2018 to May 2020. So if you can see here, um, uh, because of the pandemic recession, uh, so during this two year, three years period, uh, we had a decline of the payroll job 3.9%. However, 
uh, the tech job, di digital tech job are doing well, increased 4.6%. And healthcare support, you know, that's related to uh, this uh, pandemic, transportation, material moving, that is something what I, I'm talking about with this uh, acceleration of uh, e-commerce. So right now, let's uh, look at the subsector of this digital tech job. So we had uh, this is six, seven uh, subsectors. So the yellow bar is the total number of job uh, in 2012, and blue bar is the total number of job uh, in 2020. So the largest uh, subsector in this uh, computer and mathematical is software, web developer, programmers, and tester. So so right now we had uh, 1.8 million jobs in this subsector and followed by computer support specialists, computer and information analysis and database network administrators and architects and miscellaneous. And this is mathematical science occupation. Uh, although it's small, but you can see it increased a lot over this uh, past eight years and I'm gonna uh, talk about this uh, very interesting sector later on. All right, so here, this is the median wage uh, of this uh, digital tech job uh, by these uh, subsectors. So uh, basically you can see, we, so just despite this computer support specialist, which is a little bit um, kind of a average wage like other uh, sector, um, in 2020 is about uh, $55,000. All other sectors are very high pay uh, sectors. Like uh, it's almost uh, all are uh, above $90,000. Uh, all right, this is very important and very interesting uh, uh, slides I would like to show you. So this is the annual sector job growth rate in these uh, digital tech sectors. So I would like you to focus on this blue line, mathematical and science occupation. So why they are uh, uh, over time, you know, except 2007 and 2018, they had a very, very high growth rate. And that is because I believe it's because data science, you know, uh, uh, Turan and uh, Gus mentioned about that. This is a big trend, data science, data analytics, is in this category. And the other high growth sector is this uh, miscellaneous computer occupation. I, I think uh, we all know, you know, this uh, tech, tech innovation progress. So we, we are creating this all kinds of new job every day. So sometimes I think government Bureau of Labor State, they don't know where to put this kind of uh, occupation. So maybe um, uh, I, I believe maybe some of this kind of job actually is related to data analytics and uh, other new things. Uh, but anyway, so this is kind of uh, uh, important. So not only digital tech job are doing uh, are growing faster than the overall uh, uh, economic job, but actually in layer you can see some kind of a, 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 a difference. And although uh, this uh, data science job is small relative compared to other software web developer, but it's, uh, high in, uh, it's at a very high growth uh, uh, period right now. Okay, um, so here, let me show you the digital tech job uh, by metro, metropolitan uh, statistical area. So, um, the number one metro with the most uh, digital tech job is New York Metro. Okay, because New York Metro is big, so it's not surprising to see the, the, the uh, most uh, tech jobs, tech occupation, followed by Washington DC and Seattle. And Los Angeles, here we are uh, number four. We got 174,000 uh, digital tech occupation jobs. And in Dallas, San Francisco, Chicago, San Jose, 144,000. Uh, job. Okay. And here, these slides, I uh, just calculate uh, this take job divided by the total uh, number of workforce in that count in that metro. So, kind of you can see the tech uh, digital tech job density. Okay, by these uh, uh, forty uh, major uh, metros. So, number one 
uh, metro is San Jose, Silicon Valley, not surprising. Okay, and followed by, uh, so basically if you look at a number 130, so it means uh, among 1000 jobs, total job in, uh, in Silicon Valley, 130 are directly about digital tech uh, 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 skills. So it's very high. And then number two is Seattle. Uh, and then number three is Washington DC, San Francisco, and Austin also is doing very well. Uh, and Madison, Ralph. And Los Angeles, you know, because we are very diverse uh, 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 kind of metro. So uh, our ratio is actually is a, like a national average is around like a 30, um, 35. All right, so here I show you the median wage for this uh, digital tech job in May, 2020. So the, the metro with the highest uh, median wage of the digital tech job is Silicon Valley, San Jose, above $140,000. And followed by Seattle, San Francisco, DC, New York, Boston, Baltimore, San Diego, uh, Denver, Los Angeles. So basically you, you can see, I, I believe there are two kinds of reasons contribute to this kind of wage difference across the country. Number one is that job density. So previous slides, you can see, um, a, when the metro is a higher than average uh, density of a job, you, you can say those kind of digital tech job, they are more like a, a international player, the expo sector. So their uh, quality and the skill might be just, uh, might be higher than the average uh, tech job. So that reflect to this kind of median wage. And the other thing of course is cost of living uh, reflection. So um, you, you can see it's very interesting here, like in Nashville, okay, so there, um, median wage for this digital tech job is below $80,000. So I'm gonna show you this. So this is something people are very interested. Uh, over the past year, we got asked a lot. So with this rise of remote working, how would that impact the job uh, uh, landscape? So we can see something here a little bit, but maybe it's still too early to, to tell because the latest data we have uh, is uh, just May, 2020. So you, you can see over from May uh, 2018 to 2020. Um, so this digital tech occupation job, um, Seattle has the highest growth rates uh, above uh, 25%. And followed by Nashville, Virginia Beach, Austin, Salt Lake City, Charleville, Dallas. So besides Seattle, you know, this high growth metro actually are relatively small. So we we, um, it is not under our radar, but I believe uh, there's something about uh, reflecting to di diversify in terms of geographic location to kind of lower the cost um, uh, for, for the employer. And maybe employee has this kind of incentive uh, to kind of go to a, a maybe less dense area um, um, and less cost of living area uh, to work. We, we see this kind of uh, availability of uh, a remote working um, uh, opportunity. And Los Angeles, we are here, we are doing all right, yeah. Okay, conclusion. So uh, I got these uh, three conclusions. So the high tech industry fared well uh, in the pandemic because of the high demand, market demand of the digital and internet service, not surprised. Uh, digital tech, occupation job with their high skill and high wage, fair wear uh, in the pandemic and in the era of this technology progress. And the final conclusion I want to offer is this data analytic data science job are rising fast uh, in the era of the machine learning, big data and AI. So uh, we believe this trend will continue. And that is uh, just consistent to what uh, Terran and Gus was talking about. All right, so that's my presentation. Thank you very much.